Paul Milgram. After taking an undergraduate degree in mathematics in 1970, Milgram left university for a career as an actuary. Fortunately for us all, he returned back to university after five years in the insurance industry, earning a master's degree in statistics and a doctorate in business. His doctoral dissertation, which he defended in 1979 at Stanford University, revolutionized, <laughs> revolutionized the theory of auctions. Throughout his distinguished career, first at Northwestern University, then at Yale, and for the last 30 plus years back at Stanford University, where the voyage started, Paul Milgram has made a vast number of long-lasting contributions to the economic sciences. They range across the whole spectrum from pure game theory to finance and macroeconomics. But despite its dazzling diversity, Milgram's work always manages to shine a bright light on fundamental questions regarding the organization of economic activity. The one topic that he has always returned to, developed further and made more applicable, is that of his dissertation, the analysis of auctions. It is for this work that he receives the prize, and it's about this work that he will talk today. Hello, everyone. It's uh, great to be here today. It's uh, especially a pleasure to have been uh, awarded this prize with uh, uh, Robert Wilson, my, my PhD dissertation advisor. How exciting is that? And um, I'm, uh, Bob has already given his talk, and I'm going to talk to you today about further aspects of, of the work. Uh, my talk is entitled uh, Auction Theory Evolving because, as you'll see, We've continued to work on uh, new aspects of, and ask new questions over a, a period of years, ranging from my dissertation up to today. I have uh, the subtitle Theory and Applications with an asterisk on theory because I'm a theorist. Most of the way that I learn about auctions or I study auctions is write models of them and prove mathematically that they have certain properties. Those are theorems. But in addition, um, I also sometimes have been engaged uh, in experiments or sometimes in simulations where we uh, simulate the results of, uh, uh, of different approaches to auctions to see how they might perform. And then finally, of course, there are the applications which uh, have turned out to be quite enormous and uh, involve uh, very large uh, sums of money. So, um, the, and by the way, this picture that you see at the top here is uh, a picture provided by the, no the Nobel uh, Foundation. Um, it shows an auctioneer's hammer with um, math coming out as, uh, of the hammer as, as two men lift the, uh, lift the lid and show what's inside. So let's try to lift a little bit, uh, the, the lift the lid a little bit today and, and see what's inside some of the auction models that, uh, that we've developed. But before I begin that, I also want to thank the people who very early on in my career were major influences on my whole approach to studying these problems. Bob Wilson is the picture in the middle. David Kreps was also on my dissertation committee. And J. Michael Harrison, uh, shown here. They were the key members of my dissertation committee at Stanford University. And then when I went to Northwestern to begin my career, uh, the amazing young faculty that was there, Roger Meyerson, uh, uh, ben Holmstrom and, and uh, John Roberts were all there. John became my uh, most frequent co-author. And uh, Roger and Ben, uh, with whom I also worked, uh, are themselves Nobel laureates. And these guys were quite an inspiration. And it's a real pleasure to be able to acknowledge them as I uh, began this work. Now, the first thing that I did early in my career studying auctions was to try to integrate um, the insights that William Vickery, another Nobel laureate, and Bob Wilson uh, had uh, in their approaches to studying auctions. Vickery, who wrote the earliest 
auction models imagined that bidders who uh, attended an auction had some idea of what the thing was worth to them they were bidding for. They would have, for example, a maximum price of $100, and they would say, it's worth $100 to me. If it's a sealed bid auction, how much should I bid? If it's an English auction, what should my strategy be? And uh, that was the approach that Vickery took. And he also introduced um, using game theoretic methods and applying Nash equilibrium to study those questions. Wilson had a different model. Um, Wilson was motivated, among other things, by the bidding for mineral rights, for example, bidding for oil that might be um, uh, under, under the ground or, or under the ocean, and where those rights are being sold by the government. And the value of oil rights depends on how much oil is down there. It's roughly the same to all the bidders. It's not that bidders have different values, but they have different information about the values. And that diff different information leads to a problem that's called the winner's curse. The winner's curse is the problem that when I bid for something and I win, it, I'm more likely to win if I've overestimated the value than if I've underestimated it. So the bidders are not winning a random selection of, uh, uh, based on their estimates. They tend to win more often when, they, when they've bid too high because they've overestimated value. And there was great concern about how did, au did auction design make that problem worse? How did different auctions affect the amount of revenue that, uh, that might come from the uh, whole process? And would the seller benefit by revealing information and protecting bidders somewhat from the winner's curse if the seller had any information to share? So uh, Bob Weber shown here and, um, and I developed a model in which the both private and common value elements could be at work at the same time. So something might be worth more to me. Um, I might have a, a higher estimate of how much oil was under the ground. I might also have higher value for the oil under the ground because I had a greater need in my business. And uh, uh, a typical theorem, one of the theorems that we proved in our 1982 paper uh, studying this is in the model that we created. If you studied Nash equilibrium, the expected price, the average price that would emerge from uh, such an auction would be highest if you used an English ascending auction. It would be next if you used a, a Vickery second price auction and it would be lowest if you used a standard uh, sealed tender, um, what economists often call a first price auction. And we also proved in that model that uh, the Nash equilibrium expected price is higher when the seller shares relevant information than when he does not share that um, information. So we began to learn about the questions we were asking at the time. Do, do the auction rules matter? And how do they affect the efficiency of the auction? How do they affect the revenue that comes from the auction? Now, that was the first thing I had done. But um, as we began to get deeper into the subject, uh, Nancy Stokey and I began talking. Nancy is a distinguished fellow of the American Economic Association. And she and I were, began talking about, well, what, if, what about trade like occurs in financial markets? What if there's uh, common values, but there's concern on both sides? There's a buyer. There's a seller. The buyer's concerned he might pay too much. The seller is, uh, is, is afraid that he's only going to buy when he's overestimated the value. The seller might be concerned that she's selling too cheap. He's only going to succeed in selling if she's underestimated the value. What would happen in a common value setting where both sides were worried about the winner's curse? And how would that depend on the rules on the rules that were used? Might different rules lead to different outcomes? And again, this uh, what, what we decided to study was the simplest possible case where um, the only difference between the buyer and the seller was the information they had about what was being, um, what was being transacted. And they didn't have any fundamental reason to have different values. And we proved what became uh, a pretty well-known result called the no trade theorem in, in 1982. If we had risk-averse buyers and sellers that had the same prior beliefs but different information, and if each of them rationally decided to in, uh, participate in this mechanism and to accept whatever uh, the proposed trade that emerged from, then regardless of the rules of the mechanism, the trade had to be the zero trade, which is to say 
that there is no way that a mechanism that both the buyer and the seller would agree to participate in based only on difference in, in information would lead to trade in, um, in this setting. That was pretty surprising at the time because in financial markets, we often thought about people trading based on differences in information, but this suggested that in order for there to be effective trade with people having differences in information, there had to be some other reason for trading as well. For example, uh, uh, somebody who's just had a deposit in their pension fund is buying securities for long-term investment, or somebody who is, wishes to make a down payment on a house is selling securities for a transactions reason. And if there were people like that trading, then people who had information could be trading at the same time. Now that raised the question of what would it look like in a financial market when we had both kinds of traders present. And um, Larry Glassman and I, still at Northwestern, began to work on that. Larry was a student, uh, a graduate student in the finance department at Northwestern. And we were talking about intermediated trade, the kind that we often see on securities markets where there is a, um, somebody who makes a market, what we call the specialist, who would uh, buy uh, shares from whoever was, or, or securities from whoever was approaching to sell them and would sell from people who were approaching to buy as people ar arrived over time uh, to engage in transactions. And we imagined that some of these traders were trading for the private value reasons such as I described, you know, new investments in a pension fund or uh, payment for a college education. And some were common value traders who were speculating, who, uh, who thought they had superior information and were trying to make money on the trades. How would the um, market maker set these prices and how would, um, how would trade evolve? So, uh, and if the market makers were competing, um, how would they set the prices? And how did the prices come to reflect information? Another big idea in finance at the time was the efficient markets hypothesis that Gene Fama was advancing, especially Gene and others, um, that suggested the idea that the uh, prices would somehow efficiently combine all of the information that was available in society. Well, how did that information get to be in the prices if the traders were the ones who had it. And um, another idea that was present in the models of the time is that somehow or another, my information would already be present in prices when I was trading on that information. How could that possibly be? If the uh, specialist who's making the market doesn't know my information, how could my information possibly be in the prices before I engaged in trade? So Larry and I studied this um, and created a model in which a market maker quotes prices in competition with other market makers. And it turned out that in this model, the, uh, the, price, the market makers would end up quoting two prices, a bid price, which was what they offered to buy uh, shares that you might, or securities that you might sell to them, and an ask price, which is the price uh, that they would demand if you were buying from them. And uh, it always turned out that the ask price would be higher than the bid price. And uh, these prices were, were conditional expectations. That is, the market maker would take into account, if I offer these prices and you buy from me, maybe you're buying from me for innocent reasons, but maybe you're buying from me because you have information that I've set the price too low. And I have to build in a little margin to cover the losses that I might suffer from that. And if you're selling to me, similarly, I have to build in a little margin. I have to offer a little less to cover the losses I'm going to suffer to the parties who are uh, well informed. So the bid price and ask price would be, would be pushed apart. And the transactions price at which trade actually took place would be the ask price if the trader who comes by is buying and the bid price if the trader who came by was selling. And so we would get movement in the prices. The prices would reflect information. And notice that the price that you buy from, if you're buying from me, already reflects the fact that you want to buy from me. So your price does reflect something about your information. We were getting uh, that feature as an endogenous feature of the model that we studied. And uh, well, did this cause any trend in the prices? Would it be that prices would go up and up? Should we expect that? Or prices would go down and down depending on 
how people uh, proceeded? Well, no. The, one of the main theorems of the Glaston and Milgram paper was that transactions prices and the associated public information form a martingale. That's a mathematical object, and it means roughly that there's no drift in the prices. If when the prices step up, they tend to stay higher. Um, they might fluctuate up or down around that, but they don't systematically come back down again or systematically continue to drift up. And uh, this became a fairly standard and, and uh, well-known model of uh, trading in financial markets. Now, together with two more of my students, uh, uh, Marissa Beck and Nick Arnosti, um, I also studied uh, what would happen in uh, auctions and internet advertising. In the early days of the internet, many of the ads that appeared on websites were the same kind of things you saw in a newspaper. The local auto dealer has a sale this weekend and wants you to come in. But more and more, as we all know now, the um, uh, so-called performance advertisers would try to select particular individuals. For example, they, they uh, might decide that, uh, notice that a particular person who's uh, browsing to a website has a history of buying designer clothing and they want to show designer clothing ads to that person. Now, this created a problem for the traditional display advertisers because if you pick those people out and sold those ads separately, it might be that all the high-income people would be gone and you'd be showing your car sales ad only to low-income people who weren't likely to show up at your dealership on the weekend. There'd be a problem, a winner's curse type problem, an adverse selection type problem. And we wondered whether there was a way to design auctions to inoculate against that problem. And, um, and that was the, the problem we studied, where now for each advertiser there was a common value, some attribute of the, of the person that everybody cared about. For example, we all prefer to advertise to people with high incomes or people who are, for various reasons, responsive to advertising, but also a match value. Is that person a good match for me? If I'm selling designer clothing or I'm selling vacation travel or I'm selling uh, automobiles, I want to... Uh, be matched with people who have that need currently. Those are the people I want to advertise with. So, so we set up a model where the value was the product of those things. And we wondered, can we design an auction which protects the display advertisers against adverse selection, has a deterministic winner selection rule, it's a real auction design, it's strategy proof as the traditional auctions were at the time, the Vickery-like second price auctions. Uh, it uh, is efficient in terms of its allocation among performance advertisers, but it had two new properties. It, the property of being free of adverse selection for display advertisers so that they would be protected. And false name bidder proof, because on the internet, it would be possible to design uh, for, for a bidder to apply to bid under multiple names and try to manipulate the outcome by putting in multiple bids on, a, uh, on an item. So if you wanted to protect against that and also protect um, the display advertiser against adverse selection, what could you do? And we showed that this set of auctions that satisfy this property could be characterized. It's a one parameter family in which the um, performance advertiser wins if the ratio of the two highest uh, uh, performance advertiser bids exceed some parameter alpha. And alpha could be varied, and that gives us a one-parameter family of auctions. So these were the only auctions that had, um, that had this property. It was a brand new auction design. It was used for a little while um, uh, until the, the internet advertising uh, market has changed a lot over the years, and, um, uh, and new problems needed to be solved. But this is a, a solution, gives an example of how you take uh, a particular problem and uh, approach it mathematically to understand what's possible and what can be achieved. Now I'm going to come to uh, radio spectrum and, and invention. Um, so this is an invention that, uh, uh, that Bob Wilson and I created for the uh, Federal Communications Commission in, in 1993. Um, we were both theorists at the time. I certainly had no practical experience. And, I had thought that, um, it, you know, I had nothing to contribute really is what I thought. Um, 
but uh, Bob and I were uh, asked by what was then Pacific Bell to look at a proposed auction that the Federal Communications Commission had. And Pacific Bell's problem was that there, they had a number of problems, but one of the problems that they faced at the time was that um, they wanted to acquire licenses to covering Northern and Southern California. There were multiple different licenses that would do that, and they had to decide which ones to bid on. Um, how could they make a decision like that? And how would they know which ones were cheapest, what, 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 what the relative prices would look like? Um, along with Bob Wilson, Preston McAfee um, made a proposal very similar to ours. Um, and the FCC adopted the Milgram Wilson proposal, but it was pretty close to the McAfee proposal as well. And I'm showing here for the first time Evan Quirrell, who was um, uh, is an economist at the Federal Communications Commission, who both conceived of the whole idea of spectrum auctions in the United States and also uh, helped guide this to success. That is, he helped not only promote our ideas, but make adjustments to them so that they were practical. He was concerned about the worst case performance and directed us to focus on um, attributes like that. Now, in deciding how to solve this problem, uh, I had been influenced by um, my own participation in certain charity auctions. In charity auctions, for those of you who have attended them, one common thing is called a silent auction, where uh, there's typically a room with tables and um, items are either sitting on the tables or, or descriptions of items are sitting on tables together with a bid sheet. And you as an individual might walk around and say, you know, that bottle of wine looks interesting. I'm going to make a bid on that bottle of wine. You write down your name and you write down a number. And this goes on for an hour or so before dinner at a, at a charity event. And um, many things are for sale at the same time. That, that appealed to us as a model because with many things for sale at the same time, Pacific Bell would be able to decide which of these licenses it could afford, which was the best bargain, and, um, and bid accordingly. Um, but there was a problem in the charity auctions, and the problem was something called bid sniping. For those of you who have ever attended one of these auctions, you will know that one thing that some bidders do who are trying to get real bargains for themselves is they'll say, yeah, I want that bottle of wine, but I'm not going to bid on it yet. Um, this auction ends at 7 o'clock. I'm going to come back over here at 6.59 p.m. Uh, before the price has been bid up, and then I'm just going to make, I'm very slowly going to write down my name and a, and a price, and I'm going to win that item, and I'm going to win it without having to face competition from other bidders. So, uh, and there's a lot of that that goes on in these, um, these kinds of charity auctions. So that was bid sniping. We wondered whether we could adapt the rules of the charity auction, or I wondered whether we could adapt these rules to eliminate bid sniping. And so we created the simultaneous multiple round auction with what the FCC called the Milgram Wilson activity rule. And the idea was we introduced a new rule that kept track of the bidding that was going on in the auction. And it meant that you would be unable to make bids late in the auction if you weren't also bidding early in the auction. You couldn't just engage in bid sniping. And in addition, uh, the auction wouldn't end when, um, if a new bid was made in the last round. Whenever a new bid was made, there would always be an opportunity for somebody to come back and say, oh yeah, you bid 100, I want to bid 101. They there would always be an opportunity to reply. So these were the two changes we made relative to what um, is in the charity auction. And it was judged a great success. It got wonderful press. The New York Times had a, an article calling this the greatest auction in history. And um, it got copied around the world. And uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of radio spectrum licenses have been sold using this design that we created for the FCC in 1993. And uh, yes, I, I wrote a theorem about this, uh, that if, if the bidders bid straightforwardly, which is not what we expect, but if the bidders bid straightforwardly, this mechanism would lead to um, prices and allocations that converge to an approximate competitive equilibrium. So uh, that is, they would, the prices that would emerge would be at a reasonable level. The uh, allocations that would emerge would be efficient. Now, uh, yet another uh, advance, I, I began thinking at this time I was um, 
talking to Alvin Roth, another Nobel laureate who was at Harvard at the time, now my colleague at Stanford, uh, who had been doing work on matching markets. And um, he had redesigned the National Resident Matching Program and was interested in designing organ exchanges and such. And these were mechanisms that didn't have money involved in them at all. And yet it felt somehow to us like there was some connection between what he was doing and what we were doing. So the puzzle was um, the mechanism that Gale and Shapley introduced the, for the so-called marriage problem, which was uh, just matching with no money involved, has no role for prices. Is it connected somehow mathematically to Vickery's uh, price-based auction mechanism? You know, to, to I think, uh, to most people who look at this from the outside, it would seem that there's no connection at all. They look very different. But there were some intriguing similarities. Uh, in both mechanisms, it turns out, it's a dominant strategy for bidders to make truthful offers, both in the Gale Shapley mechanism and in Vickery's mechanism. And in both mechanisms, if they make truthful offers and if the offers are substitutes, then the outcome is what's called a core allocation, and it's a particular core allocation, the one that's most preferred by the bidders. This, these are just, it's just too much of a coincidence that those properties would be shared by these two very different looking mechanisms. So John and I, John Hatfield shown here, and I, uh, John was a graduate student at Stanford at the time, introduced our model of matching with contracts. And in the matching with contracts model, um, offers are accompanied by terms. So for example, uh, if a man makes a proposal to a woman in the Gale Shapley model, in the Gale Shapley model he just says, will you marry me? And uh, in our model he says, uh, will you marry me and let's be graduate students at Stanford for the next four years. Or he says, will you marry me and uh, we'll go run my dad's store in Topeka, Kansas uh, after we're married. And, and, and uh, in, in our model, the woman could care not just about the man, but about the terms. And when those terms were uh, allowed to be money, then what you have is an auction. And when those terms are trivial, that is when the only thing you, can, uh, you care about is the name of the person, that's the Gale Shapley mechanism. But there's a whole class of mechanisms that's encompassed by uh, this matching with contracts models, and all of them share these properties that are shown here. So we were able to show that these two mechanisms are both special cases of our matching with contracts mechanisms, and that all of these mechanisms share these properties. And these mechanisms, by the way, have been subsequently used to develop new kinds of market designs now that we understand how these properties can be generalized. Now, radio spectrum allocation is actually quite a bit more complicated than what I hinted early on. We were able to deal with simple cases where the licenses were substitutes for the bidders, but often real bidders have a problem of, of, they have a business plan in mind, and they're trying to win a collection of licenses that allows them to implement that plan. For example, in the first auction, Pacific Bell wanted coverage in both Northern and Southern California to have a statewide plan. Um, this was before the national plans that are obviously so, uh, so prominent today. And uh, sometimes bidders needed to achieve efficient scale. They needed to uh, buy sufficient bandwidth uh, uh, in the licenses they acquired to make their plans viable. And the risk that they face in the traditional design is they might win some licenses uh, that give them part of what they need for their businesses without being able to acquire the rest to uh, actually have a viable plan. So the way that's handled in, uh, in spectrum auctions is to allow bidders to bid for combinations of licenses. Now, um, there are lots of combinations, and figuring out which combinations to bid on, they need some guidance about what the prices will be. And uh, Peter Crampton and Larry Ozabel, the top row here, uh, worked with me to develop a method to help provide that information to bidders before the final round of bidding, in which they had to commit to the licenses they were trying to acquire. And Bob Day, shown in the, uh, at the bottom here, worked with me on the, uh, on the problem of finding a good price. That is, the first question was how do bidders identify and bid on relevant packages? And the second is what pricing rule creates the best incentives for the bidders to report their information truthfully, subject to ensuring 
that there is competitive revenue for the seller. The government gets a fair price for, for what it's selling. And uh, uh, Bob Day and I sh uh, showed that an auction design minimizes the uh, bidder's total incentives to bid untruthfully um, and provides competitive revenue from truthful bidding if and only if it's in a class that we identified uh, of what so-called the minimum revenue course selecting auctions. So um, we identified the class of auctions that uh, of pricing rules that would have uh, this property. And again, this is used for real life auction design. It's been used in many auctions, uh, not in the US, but in, in Mexico and in Canada and the UK and Australia and around the world. Now package bidding is, um, is a hard problem because there are so many packages a bidder can bid on. If you have an auction for 100 licenses, there are two to the power 100 different combinations that you can make from those. And that's way too many for anybody to bid on in practice. And so together with John Cagle shown here and Yen Chen Lin, who was a, a student of mine, John's a, a professor at Ohio State University, we wondered, what can you do? Can we have um, a good outcome in this kind of circumstance? And we showed that if bidders uh, bid to uh, up to their limits on relevant packages, then the, um, uh, you can get good outcomes. You can get efficient uh, allocations or, or core allocations that emerge from this bidding. And we also showed that you could use simulations with auto bidders to predict how bidders would bid to see whether relevant packages could emerge from uh, different auction designs. Now the biggest of our um, of our challenges was the recent uh, incentive auction, the broadcast incentive auction. Um, the concept for this was uh, Evan Quirrell and John Williams created this. And the idea was that to buy TV broadcasters rights from some TV broadcasters to repack the others into a smaller set of channels and then to sell the, uh, to create television broad, uh, to, to create mobile broadband licenses out of what remains and sell those to uh, mobile broadband companies. And uh, this is a particularly hard problem because the uh, deciding whether you can assign TV broadcast channels uh, to uh, broadcasters without creating interference is what's called an NP hard problem. It's a problem that's hard even for uh, computers. And, um, I led a team from my company, Auctionomics, with uh, Ilya Segal, my colleague at Stanford uh, Economics Department, and Kevin Leighton Brown, a uh, computer scientist at the University of British Columbia. We created new algorithms, especially Kevin created new algorithms to, uh, uh, to do a better job of, of approximating the solution to this problem. And Ilya and I created a class of new auction designs that became, um, the, the, it was a class of new auction designs that actually accommodated computational limits on computers while still providing the uh, kinds of good properties, strategy proofness, budget compliance, privacy preservation that were desired from auction designs um, generally. Now, I have a, a lot more going on. I've got a bunch of uh, co-authors on working papers currently in progress. On the first column here, you see Mohammed Akbarpour, Sheng Wu Li, Scott Commoners, with whom I'm working on, on investment incentives in uh, auction problems, Martin Bickler and Gregor Sch Schwartz, uh, Josh Molnar, uh, Neil Newman, Mitch Watt, with whom I'm working on a series of other problems that are all related to auction design or to the underlying game theory that helps us analyze the auction design. And besides these guys, I'm really proud of the newest group of, uh, of students that are coming along that I, I know are going to have a major impact. And you may see a gender difference in this group, too. A lot more women involved uh, now in, in this. You see, uh, uh, you see Agat and Pearl and Evan in the top row. And, and you see Ziang and Lucas and Kevin in the bottom row. Uh, these are all tremendous students who are going to have a, a big impact on the future of, uh, of auction and market design. I'm, I'm very pleased to welcome them to the group and I hope you will join me in doing that.